We'll uh, get started. Okay, so uh, first off, uh, just recall that your assignment is due in a week. So we went through it uh, last class. Uh, is there any questions about it now that you've had a week to read it? Or is it pretty straightforward? Okay, I see no questions, so uh, it should be okay. Uh, if not, uh, you know, you can ask me an email or whatever. Say it louder, sorry. Can we discuss after the class? Yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. yeah. It's out of whatever this adds up to, which is some number that's less than 100. Yeah, so actually it was a confusing thing in last year because uh, students would get like 82 and they would think it's 82%, but it might have been 82 out of 82 or something like that. So uh, uh, anyways, uh, yeah, so it won't be, it won't be out of 100. <clears throat> Other questions? Okay, uh, any, any questions about anything? Last, last class, uh, anything else? No? Okay. So the one thing that's missing from assignment one is, uh, is how to submit it. Uh, so last year we used something called EAS. You now need a VPN uh, to access it. It was kind of frustrating. So I'm going to try and do it through Moodle, but I didn't set it up yet. So I need to sit down for an hour and figure out how to do it. I think it's possible. Uh, but anyways, if it's not possible, whatever, I'll... Um, I'll update the assign. I'll update the assignment itself with more explicit instructions, and if I feel it's necessary, I'll send an email to everyone as well, like outlining uh, how to do things. Um, the backup. We could go back to EAS, or we could go to uh, like Google Forms or something like that. So there'll be an easy way to collect the assignments. I just haven't figured out what what it's going to be yet. But anyways, you do need uh, you need access to Moodle. So if you haven't logged into Moodle, uh, then uh, you'll, you'll have to make sure that you have that set up and, and all that stuff in order to, to do the assignment itself. The, the advantage of Moodle is that you'll get your mark back through Moodle. That was the nice thing about EAS is that you would just get your mark directly back from the system. We could just collect the, all the PDFs like in Google Forms, but then we have to figure out how we're going to give your mark back to you. And the TAs, I don't want him sending like 100 emails. It's kind of annoying. So if there's some sort of automation there, that, then we'll try and use it. Um, I'll, I'll just note that it is marked by the TA. Um, so uh, if you have questions and, and things like that, uh, you can ask him uh, about it. But. Okay, uh, no further questions. Okay, so we'll jump back into the lectures then. Um, so this is what we're shooting for is an attack tree. Uh, so an attack tree that covers all the attacks on HTTPS uh, and so so far we've gone through about half of the tree so we've uh, looked and seen what can you tell if you're just in a man in the middle position you're looking at the traffic go by it's everything is working correct uh, correctly but but you can still learn things just by looking at the channel itself so there were were these sets of attacks and then we also consider what would happen if you were able to break the channel uh, breaking into the channel involves a lot of cryptographic attacks, so I didn't want to go through all the crypto details of, of how the protocol works. So I gave some, some examples that don't involve the cryptography, and then the ones that do, I sort of sketched out at a high level how they work without ignoring some of the, the actual details of the cryptography itself. But anyway, so the attack tree is complete. So there's going to be a bunch of things here like Beast, Lucky13, Poodle, RC4 biases, these are things that we didn't cover in class. So don't feel that you're missing something if you see them in the tree. I just want to give you a complete tree. There are also things that, you know, for a project or something like that, if, you're, if you really like this stuff, there are things that you can look at. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so... Uh, the uh, attack tree, there's different ways of doing the attack tree itself. So I did link to, I, I assume that you're asking because one of the articles I linked to, uh, the Bruce Schneier one, I think, this one. It has like a bunch of semantics about the tree itself. 
we're not doing that at all. So like there's different people will tell you different ways of doing attack trees. This is a more formal approach. Uh, we're doing a, a, a more informal uh, kind of approach itself. So we're not using any logic. We're not using conjunctions or unions or anything like that. Uh, it's for us. It's more of just a, a high level brainstorm of what all the attacks are that are possible. Yeah, but uh, th if you wanted to do a more formal attack tree, then you could add that type of thing to it as well. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So just remember that our our overall goal is to try and figure out what the traffic is that's going across this encrypted channel that we can't otherwise read. And we had three main ideas of how to attack it. So the first was we just sit outside the tunnel, we try and figure out what we can see. And we saw that that was actually reasonably effective because we can see the length of the packets. We can see what domain the packet's coming from. Then you can actually infer quite a bit, especially with websites that blend uh, different resources together from different sources. Uh, in fact, you could create kind of unique fingerprints and figure out exactly what people are looking at. Uh, but it doesn't work for private information, okay? It only works for public websites where you could index it. Uh, to break into the tunnel, that works, but it gets fixed, right? So it's a sort of cat and mouse game where someone comes up with an attack, then the protocol changes or the implementations change. And so none of the attacks in that category really work today with the exception of kind of like store everything so that you might be able to break it tomorrow. All right. And then the third high level uh, idea that we have is what if we can get the tunnel pointed at us? If we can be the endpoint of the tunnel, then it doesn't matter. Then again, we're in the world where uh, the protocol can work exactly as it was intended to. Everything's perfect about it. The cryptography actually works. It's, it's actually private. We're not breaking any of the properties of the protocol itself, uh, but because it's the tunnel's coming to us, then we're able to read and see everything. And then we can even open up a tunnel from us to the website itself, and we can just relay information back and forth, reading it all in the middle, and if we want to modify it, we can make modifications as well, okay? Okay, so the high-level idea here is that HTTPS, we said it provides confidentiality so messages stay private. It provides integrity so if there's a change to the message content itself, it can be detected at both ends. And then the third thing is server authentication. So we somehow know where the tunnel ends. So from my perspective on my computer, all I know is I'm dropping packets into a tunnel. And I can see that I'm putting them in the tunnel, right? But I don't know where does the tunnel end. Okay, the tunnel might end before it even leaves my computer, right? It could end at the operating system. It could end at the Wi-Fi router. It could end on some backbone server uh, between here and where I'm trying to actually get to. It might go completely to a wrong place, right? It, it, I'm trying to go to Google and it's going to the adversary instead who's at a completely different domain. Okay, so uh, if I don't control where the tunnel ends, then I might as well, it's almost like I might as well not use HTTPS at all uh, because, you know, then I, I have no guarantees, okay? So where the tunnel ends is, is absolutely critical. Uh, to, to the, the protocol does not work if you cannot dictate where it ends, okay? All right, so there's a lot of cryptographic details that go into, like, what does it mean for like where the tunnel ends, okay? I'm gonna simplify all of that for you, okay? Every entity that wants to participate in the system, including the adversary, they have a number called a public key, okay? It's a big number, okay? But it's, it's just a number. And if I can reach that number, like it, instead of thinking of it like I wanna to go to google.com, I just ask myself, okay, what's Google's public key? What, what's the number that belongs to Google? And if I get that right, then I will have a tunnel that ends at Google, okay? There's a lot of crypto magic that happens, okay? But it's really that simple. It's just if, if I know Google's public key, then I can have a tunnel that ends at Google, okay? So this whole problem can be basically reduced to, you have a bunch of people that, that you might want a tunnel to, 
and you have a bunch of numbers and you have to figure out whose number actually belongs to whose. Okay? Now you can't just go to Google and ask them what's your number because first off you don't know that you're actually talking to Google because you don't know their number yet. Right? So you have this kind of bootstrapping process. And even if you get Google, the right Google, and they tell you the number, if there's an adversary, the, number, the adversary will switch the number to their number. Now you think that, that the adversary's number is Google, and so then you, your tunnel ends at the adversary, right? So if you use the adversary's number instead of Google's number, then the tunnel ends at the adversary instead of Google, okay? So what we need is kind of like a big phone book that says, here's all the domains, and then here's all the numbers, and if we had that magic phone book, then this whole problem would be solved. There's nothing there, okay? But unfortunately, for reasons that we'll go through, you can't really build that phone book, all right? And so what we're going to do is we're going to approximate it, and it's going to be messy and problematic. So that whole idea is sometimes called PKI, public key infrastructure, and it's just basically, you know, whose public key belongs to who. And then there's some more complicated questions too, like, once you figure out that this is somebody's number, does, does that information last forever? Or should it expire after a certain amount of time? What if someone steals your number, right? Then, then what do you do? Can you revoke it? Can you change it? Can you modify it? How do you recover from it? So there's a little more into PKI, not really in the web space, but another thing is delegation. So like, I'm going to be away from work, so I'm going to give my number to someone else so they can use it for a week, but then I want it back after a week. And so these are the kinds of like PKI like kind of questions that you see. Um, but anyways, ours is going to be very simple, the simplest, which is just like whose number belongs to who. Okay. All right. Uh, so actually, before I show the slide, although you've already seen it, how, does anyone know how this works? So I, I want to go to google.com. I want a tunnel that ends at google.com. Okay. So how do, how, how do I do that? How do I, how do I figure out that I'm actually talking to google.com? So I see that lock. So that means, that means I'm on one end of the tunnel. That's really what that lock means. It just means I, I have a secure tunnel to someone, right? But, but who? Okay, okay, yeah, so that's mostly right. We'll go through all the little details of it, but yeah. So what we're going to do is we're going to rely on these things called certificates, okay? So simply what a certificate is, it's kind of like an entry in that, that magic phone book that we wish that we had. So it's a domain, like concordia.ca, and then a number, a big long number, that's their public key, okay? And if we can get this binding correct, then we're fine, okay? Now, the problem, the first problem, which you sort of answered, is where do I get this information from, right? So I, someone has to give this information to me, all right? So what a certificate is, is it's a statement of what the information is, but beyond that, it's actually signed off by someone, okay? So there's these things called certificate authorities. Oh, yeah, I'll just note that that... I, I don't know whether that's, that's actually Concordia's number or that's the adversary's number, okay? The adversary can also create a document that says concordia.ca and says their public key, and they can call that a certificate and pass it around, okay? So this in and of itself doesn't do anything. It's just, it's, it's a statement of what it should be, but I don't know whether it's right or wrong, okay? So what I do is I get a company uh, to sign off on it. So these are called certificate authorities, okay? So for example, there's a company called Globosign, and so they're going to sign this document saying, yes, uh, Concordia's public key is this value, uh, and then they, they sign it, okay? So problem solved, right? Is there any issue with this? Okay, all right, so good. So uh, the CA signs something. What, if I wanna verify that signature, what do I need to do? What does it mean to verify a signature? What, like, what kind of information would I need 
to, to verify a signature. OK, so what I need is the message itself, which is the certificate. So I have that. And then I need the public key of the CA, right? OK, how do I know what this, the CA's public key is? OK, OK, so that could be an answer. So we'll get there eventually. But for now, let's just pose the, the question before answering it that way. Um, it's kind of the same question again, right? I wanted to know what Concordia's public key was. I didn't know. So I got the certificate that's signed by a CA. But now I need to know the CA's public key to know that the certificate's valid. And so how do I know what the CA's public key is? And if I know what the CA's public key is, why don't I just use that mechanism to know what Concordia's CA is? Right, so why doesn't Concordia's CA just come, why doesn't their key just come in my computer the same way? Okay, so that, that's the first question that we can ask ourselves. So this, this could be the adversary just created the certificate and, and signed it themselves. Okay, then the other issue is, let's say this is real, okay? How did GlobalSign figure out that that's Concordia's public key? Because they're vouching for this information. So somehow they figured out that that was actually Concordia's public key. So they have some method, call it method X. Well, why don't we just use method X? Why do we need GlobalSign? If GlobalSign can figure that out, then we can figure it out too. So why, why do we even need CAs? Okay, so those are the two kind of questions. Um, so the first one is, uh, we're using CAs to solve this problem of I don't know whose public key belongs to who, but in order to do that, I need to know the CA's public key because they're signed by the CAs, okay? So it's kind of circular. And then the other problem is that the CAs, they're signing off on other people's public keys. They have some way of doing that. Whatever way they're using, why don't I just do it myself? And then we don't need CAs at all, okay? So these are the two questions we can ask ourselves going forward. So let's start with the first one. Okay, so the answer was given already. Uh, so how do I know the public key of the certificate authority? And the answer is I go to the Apple store, I buy a brand new MacBook Pro Air, and I turn it on for the very first time. It's never been on the internet. Uh, it's never connected to anything. It's fresh out of the box. I turn it on. It comes with the public key of a bunch of CAs, certificate authorities, hard-coded in the computer itself, okay? So these are called root certificates. Uh, so they're in there, they're in the operating system. Uh, generally, if I'm using my Mac, I'm using that list of certificate authorities. Sometimes when I download a browser, the browser might come with its own list. So Firefox is an example of a browser that comes with its own list. So if I'm using Firefox on a Mac, I'm actually using Firefox's list. Otherwise, I'm using the operating system. So if I'm using Safari or Chrome, I'm using the operating system. Windows has its own list of CAs. Uh, if you use Google, like Android or Chromebook, um, Chrome OS, it will come with its own list. Um, and all the lists look kind of the same. Like they, they more or less look the same. They might not be exactly identical, uh, but, but they, they are very, very similar. Okay. Um, now, I did put plural here, so certificate authority, so there's more than one. So GlobalSign is not the only certificate authority uh, that, that uh, would come uh, with your computer. How many do you think there are, if you had to guess? Ten? Ten? Yeah, less than 100. Okay, from a security perspective, what would we prefer to see? Would we like to see a small number or a big number? Okay, small number, why? I mean, it's obvious, but just state it to complete the idea. Okay, okay. So if you break one CA, you kind of break the whole system. And so securing 10 CAs is easier than securing 100 CAs, for example, okay? So for that reason, we want, um, we want a world where there's a small, sorry, a small number, okay? So would the best world be one where there's a single CA? Okay, we don't like that either. Why don't we like it? Okay, okay, so there's two reasons, I guess. One is reliability. So if that CA ever, something went wrong with them, then the whole system turns on. So we want robustness, so that means there's some redundancy in terms of the number of CAs, uh, but we don't want too many because then we have a security problem, 
okay? Um, so we have to find that, that balance. And then the other reason is sort of business economic reasons. So if you had the monopoly and you were the one CA, then you could charge a million dollars for a certificate and then that would create all sorts of issues as well. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So if I use Firefox with on macOS, that's the situation where I have two. Uh, and then Firefox itself will choose to use its own. But every other application on my computer will choose to use the operating system. So the operating system basically says it's here if you want it. If you want to do your own thing, that's fine. But it's here and it's available. So yeah. Okay, so how do, how do I see the certificate authorities? Let's say I, I, they're on my computer, right? So I should be able to see them. Can I see them? How? Yeah, I can, I, I can see them, but how? how? I, I, let's do it right now. I, let's look at them. I want to see if there's 10 or more. So what do I do? Okay, so it's going to depend on your operating system. Right, so I'm on a Mac, so the way I do it will be different. Uh, but anyways, there is a thing called uh, keys chain. And so if I open this up, it has a whole bunch of stuff in it, uh, like it saves my passwords and a, a bunch of other stuff. But if I want to see the uh, certificates, uh, I can see them here. Okay, so remember we said 10-ish CAs, right? All right, so these are all the CAs. I'll just scroll nice and slowly. So remember, we said if there was a lot, that's kind of a security issue, right? Because one of these things goes wrong, then the whole thing goes wrong. OK, so is this list maybe a little longer than we were expecting to see? OK, yeah. And so if you count them up, some of them, like Amazon, for example, they have like four certificates. So some of them are, are kind of duplicates. Um, but there's probably around 50, 50 to 100. We'll say it's, it's about 50. I didn't explicitly count, but there's about 50 of them uh, in, the, uh, in the store. OK, so they come hard coded. There's a lot of CAs. There's about 50 unique companies. Sometimes companies own other companies. And the other issue, too, is um, I, I mentioned Amazon. You've all heard of Amazon, I assume, right? But how many people have heard of, I don't know, ComSign or Komodo or DigiCert, Entrust? Entrust is Canadian, you might have heard of them, but GeoTrust, you know? Yeah, so, so most of these are companies you've never even heard of, okay? Do you trust them? Do you trust GeoTrust? You are, every time you use your computer, you're inherently trusting GeoTrust. Right? You might trust, you might decide, oh, I trust Amazon, I know Amazon, right? But there's all these things and you don't even know who they are, right? Uh, and so, so anyways, okay, so why, why does this matter? And this is the main message, I guess, of this whole lecture. If you remember one thing, any CA can sign a certificate for any site, okay? So if you can get a certificate from any one of those 50 companies, then you can impersonate someone else. You can have the tunnel. When, when the person, the user intends to go to google.com, you can drop in a valid Google certificate, right? It's signed by one of these companies. So the user will check, is this actually signed by something I know on my computer? It passes the check and it has your key instead of Google's key. So now the tunnel's ending at you, okay? So in other words, a failure in one of these 50 companies and the whole architecture of, of this whole HTTPS thing kind of breaks down. Okay, now let me uh, just try a few things here. So if you, by the way, if you ever want to see the certificate, uh, what you can do is you can, uh, you can go to uh, the lock, click on it. It will look different on different operating systems, but it, it usually clicking the lock will bring you to a screen that looks something like this. So this is Concordia's certificate. It's signed by GlobalSign. GlobalSign itself signed it. So this is the GlobalSign that's on my computer. This is another certificate kind of in the middle. 
and then there's the actual Moodle. And there's a lot more in it. I made it sound like it was just the, the domain and the public key. There's a bunch of more information that's in it, but those are the two pieces of critical information. So um, there's uh, moodle.concordia.ca. And then if you want to see this magic public key itself, uh, it's here. So this is the, 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 the number that we're most concerned about. OK, let me uh, just try a few things. I'm just going to see if I can find an example of what I want to show. So this is actually interesting. I asked for TSN over HTTPS, but it's not showing the lock. So that means probably, my guess is that they mixed in some content uh, that was served over TSN and some that wasn't. I know this is so much fun watching me type in random URLs. I should have. Tried to find an example first. Um. Okay, I'm going to try one more, and then we'll I'll just show you what I want to show you. Okay, so this is a good example. All right, so we're on CBC's website, and uh, we can see that they have a certificate, and their certificate was issued by GeoTrust. Okay. But GeoTrust itself, its certificate was issued by another company called DigiCert. So DigiCert's the thing that's on my computer. I have a DigiCert root certificate. And what happened is DigiCert signed a certificate for this company called GeoTrust. Then GeoTrust signed the certificate for CBC. Okay? So there was a middle party. Uh, this is called a subsidiary CA or an intermediary CA. Okay? So, uh, so you have a site certificate. It's signed by some CA called, say, R3. And then uh, R3 will have a certificate. It will be signed by a different CA, ISRG. And then ISRG would be the thing that's on my actual computer itself. OK? Now, my question to you, first off, is so these are called intermediary or subsidiary CAs. OK? How do I see the list of intermediary or subsidiary CAs? So I saw the list of all the root CAs, right? Where, where's the list of all the intermediaries? OK, OK, yeah. So just some language. So we call this a chain, a certificate of chain. So in terms of practicality, if I go to a website, what the website will do, it's sort of their burden to give me all the certificates in the chain. So they won't, they won't make me like go around and ask. They'll just say, here's the complete chain. And then I'll just check that it chains back to something that's on my computer. OK? But let me phrase the question. My question's a little different. I'll phrase it differently. We said there's 50 companies that have root certificates. OK? How many companies have intermediary certificates? So that GeoTrust company, they weren't a root. Now, I think they actually have a root certificate. And they're, but anyways, but let's just assume that they don't, right? So they're not in that list of root certificates, OK? So in other words, there's a bunch of companies out there that are still issuing certificates, OK? But they're not showing up in that list of 50 companies. I want to know how many are there. So how do I, how do I figure out how many there are? I don't, I don't expect anyone to know the answer. I'm just I'm looking for guesses. OK. OK, you see the chain when you go to the website that uses it? OK, so maybe that would, it, it, you could look through your caches for every website that you've seen. But I want a list of everyone that's out there, even if I've, whether I've seen it or not. How do I check? So it's, it's a good idea, but 
how do, 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 how do I know that they sign? If, if the root certificate signs a site certificate for GeoTrust, like where's that written down? Okay, so the answer is that you can't see them. Okay, they're not written down. You don't see an intermediary certificate until you go to a website that uses it. Otherwise, you don't know that it exists, okay? So you go to a website, it uses that intermediary, you see it for the first time, okay? Now, these intermediary certificates are almost as powerful as a root certificate, okay? So they can issue a certificate for any site. They, they are a CA, okay? So the fact that, that it, if you get it signed directly by a root CA or you get it signed by an intermediary, it doesn't make any practical difference at all from a website, okay? So if an adversary wants to take over a company, they don't have to take over a root certificate necessarily. They can take over one of these intermediaries. And we don't know how many intermediaries there are, generally speaking, okay? Now, we have some guesses. Um, and so one thing we can do is we can go to every single website on the internet, all right? And it sounds kind of crazy, but previously before we had IPv6, we could do it by actually just going to every IP address, okay? And you can scan the entire IPv4 uh, address space. It would take a couple days, but it's, it's not like impossible, okay? So you would just go to that IP address. You'd say, I want to talk HTTPS. The website would either say, well, first off, the website not, might not exist, right? But if it exists, it might say, I, I speak it or I don't. And if it speaks it, it will send the certificate. Then you write it down, and then you write down the intermediary certificate that you see. And so when people do this experiment, they see somewhere between two and 600 companies in addition to the 50 companies that are, are root CAs uh, on your computer, okay? A lot of these are regional. So they're like, they're not US based. So that list and all the companies like Apple, Chrome, uh, Firefox, you know, these are all US companies, right? So there's a dominance of US companies in the root certificate list. But when you move to the intermediaries, that's where you start seeing, you know, different countries will have uh, different authorities uh, within their country. Yeah. Yep, yeah, so that can happen too. So you can have chains of, of chains. Um, but in order for an intermediary to sign another intermediary, it has to be approved by the root. So what the root will do is when they give the certificate, like this middle certificate, they also have some constraints. So they can say, you can only make a chain of length two, or you can make a chain of length one, or you, uh, so that, that's the main thing. So they, they can control it. Uh, and in, in general, any CA that's up the chain from you can control what you do with it. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Uh, another thing is there's a project called Certificate Transparency. So this became a big problem because now you have, you know, 200, 250, 400 uh, targets. And uh, if one of them gets breached, you know, any CA can sign a certificate for any site. Um, so what people did is they said, well, let's at least log every certificate. And so there's this project called Certificate Transparency. It tries to log all the certificates. Some browsers require for certain kinds of certificates, uh, like the, uh, we haven't talked about them yet, but they require those kinds of certificates to go in the log. And if they don't see it in the log, then the browser will reject it. So slowly over time, uh, it's becoming more transparent about how many of these things there are. Uh, but there's still kinds of certificates that you could have where you're not required to log it in Certificate Transparency. Um, and so you would, yeah, so there, there's still intermediaries out there that we don't really know. And because of IPv6, there could be IP addresses that, that no one scanned. And then the other thing is, if you come to my website, I'll send you a certificate chain. But if someone else comes to my website, I'm not necessarily going to send them the same chain, right? So I might have multiple chains. Say I have chains for people in Canada. So I see your IP address is coming from Canada. I send you one chain but I see someone come from another country, I send them a different chain. So these IPv4 scans are also, you know, it's like University of Berkeley will do it from Berkeley. And so they'll see everything that an American would see scanning the internet, but it's not necessarily what other people in other countries would see, okay? Um, especially when things go wrong. Like if there's some sort of attack there and someone's spying, right? They might not spy on everyone. They might only spy on a subset of their users, okay? So unless if you ran that scan from that subset of users that are being spied on, you wouldn't pick up the fact that there's some weird 
see it. Okay, so this whole CA system, this whole PKI system, it basically, we call it weakest link security. So that's the highest level, which is if, if one thing breaks, then the whole system kind of breaks, okay? So um, if you're able to breach one of those CAs, it doesn't matter if it's a root or an intermediary, uh, then if you want a Google certificate, a Facebook certificate, whatever certificate you want, you can create, okay? Now, I want to note that there are some defenses that are emerging against this. Um, so if you're a major website like Google, you can do things like, first off, Safari knows what Google's, they know something about their keys. They might not know their exact key, but they'll know the certificate authority they use. And so if they see some weird certificate for Google, then uh, they're gonna know that it's wrong, okay? But that's because it's a major website. <coughs> Google's also a major browser. And so what Google does is they start pinning the details of their certificates in Chrome. And if you ever go, if you're in Chrome, and let's say you go out, you type in google.com and you get some weird certificate in response, Chrome will recognize that it's not one of their certificates and it will actually phone home back to Google headquarters with, this is, look at the certificate we just saw. It's actually valid, but it doesn't match any of the details. Probably one of these CAs got breached. And so Chrome turned this feature on like, I don't know, I forget when, like mid 2000s, actually maybe 2010s. Um, but anyways, within a month of them turning it on, we discovered for the first time a bunch of certificates from CAs uh, that, that were misissued. Um, so, so that's probably how they were detected uh, in it. But anyways, I'm not, I'm not Google, we're Concordia, or it's my personal website or something like that, right? I'm not gonna get my certificate details into Chrome itself or into Safari, okay? And so the system has to work for everyone, not just the big, not just the big players. So this is still a big problem. Okay, the, the other thing I note is that if you go through the list, some of them are just, they're just tech companies, right? Um, but if you go through the list closely, you notice that not all of them are like politically neutral, okay? So some of them are governments themselves. Some of them are divisions of the government. For example, Department of Homeland Security in the United States, they had an intermediary certificate at least at one time. I don't know if it's still active today. So technically that branch of the US government could sign a certificate for any site if they wanted to, okay? And there's also, uh, yeah, there's, there's other countries that do more surveillance of their citizens. Uh, so there's countries where the internet is highly restricted. Uh, and so those countries may have companies within them as well uh, that have CAs, okay? And so this would be another way to, if you were a government, autocratic government, you want to spy on your citizens, if you can use your laws and regulations to take over a CA, then you can also, this, this SSL infrastructure isn't going to protect the users from, from that type of spying. So I'll, I'll give some concrete examples in, in a bit about this. Or, or I guess now. Um, yeah, so, so, so one example is uh, there's, um, in the UAE, uh, the big telecom there is Etisela, I, I don't know how to pronounce it. Um, but they uh, were caught, uh, on behalf of the government, they were, because they're a telecom, uh, what would happen is you get a phone from them and they have like firmware that they can put on your phone. And so the firmware that was coming down had a back door in it. Uh, it was discovered, it was kind of like global news uh, that this had happened. And then some people said, oh, I wonder if they have a certificate authority. And then they went and looked and they're a major telecom, so it's sort of natural that they would have one. Uh, and so it turned out that they had one as well. Uh, so then there was this big um, like protest and things like that of, of people trying to get uh, all the CAs like Apple, Firefox, Microsoft to get rid of this certificate authority, remove it from uh, all of the certificate authorities and, and block it. I think ultimately they weren't successful, um, but, but anyways, this was like one example of, of a, something that made it to like the news. Like normally like, what goes on in certificate authorities isn't like in the New York Times, right? Uh, but this was one of the cases where it, 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 ra it rise to that level. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> so this solves the first question that we had. So we said, how does Alice know the public key of the certificate authority? And so the answer is it either was on her computer 
uh, or it links chains back uh, to something that's that's on her computer. OK. Uh, then the second part of the question is, uh, why can't Alice use the same method to determine the key of the website? Uh, sorry, just let me think about this. OK, I, I'm going to answer that. I don't have slides for that. I, I'll answer the second part of the question as the second part of the second question. It's kind of the same question. Um, so yeah, just put a pin in that idea. I, I will answer it in a few slides. OK, but let's move on to the second issue. So the second issue is, how does the certificate authority? So now we, we know that it's, it's GlobalSign. We trust GlobalSign, whatever. We chain back to it, OK? So GlobalSign is telling me that Concordia's public key is this value, OK? I trust GlobalSign, so that's not a problem, OK? That's not the problem I have. My problem now is, how was it that GlobalSign figured out what Concordia's public key was? Right, because they're they're signing off on it. They're putting their business reputation on the line, saying that this is Concordia's public key. How was it that they were able to figure it out? They're another channel to communicate with the company. Normally, well, in my company, it works, it works like that. Okay. Okay. So that that could be one answer. So that is a valid answer. Um, so it turns out that there's two kinds of certificates. So there's the the. Certificate where the CA would actually reach out to the company or vice versa. The company would say, I want a certificate and they would call the company or they would ask for business documents to be sent in the mail and all of that kind of stuff. And then when they make the certificate, say they're making it for Concordia, they know who Concordia is. They know it's Concordia. They know they own Concordia.ca. They might own a couple other domains. They know it's the university in Montreal. They know the street address all that kind of stuff. So they're really signing off on a whole bunch of information, not just this is the domain concordia.ca and this is the actual key, okay? So that works great. Is there any problem with that kind of thing? Why not, why not? So that could be true, but let's ask the question, why not? Okay, so one reason why is that for this type of thing, they're looking for some sort of registered business name with the government, okay? So that's part of what they're validating. Uh, and so if you don't have a registered business name because you just set up a website, you're not going to be able to get this kind of certificate. So this is called an extended verifiable certificate, okay? How long do you think this would take to get a certificate? Days, okay, not, not minutes, not hours. It would take days, weeks, something like that. Okay, what if you wake up one day, you, you run an e-commerce site, you're doing lots of business. Uh, certificates have a shelf life, so usually they issue them for a year or two. And you wake up one day and lots of e users are emailing you saying, hey, we can't access your website. We get this weird SSL error. And then you go to your website and you realize, oh, I forgot to renew my certificate. It expired yesterday, right? It happens all the time. Do you want to wait days and weeks to get a new one? No. Okay, you're losing, I don't know, millions of dollars every single day, right? That's a $7 million problem now because you have to wait seven days. And if it takes the CA eight days instead of seven, that's eight million instead of seven million. Okay, so that's, that's crazy. You don't, want, uh, you don't want that kind of situation. Okay, so that's, that's the other reason is that you want something faster. So there's an alternative called domain validation. It validates loss about your company. It doesn't actually validate any details at all. It just tries to validate that the person who owns this domain, concordia.ca, I have no idea who they are. Are they the university? I don't know. I don't know what it is. I just know that this is their domain and then this is their public key. So I'm just going to sign off on that little bit of information. And then hopefully, I can maybe do that in an automated way or semi-automated way. Then we can get certificates in minutes instead of in days. Okay, so both of these exist in time. Today, they actually look exactly the same. So if you go to a website and they have an EV certificate or they have a DV certificate, it looks the same. It presents the same way to the user. So you would never know uh, the differences. But as recently as five years ago, they actually look different. So there was a period of time where we tried to distinguish between them on behalf of the user. If, does anyone remember what it might look like or how you might know that there's a difference between the two? Sorry, say? Okay, exactly, exactly. 
Okay. So, um, okay. Actually, I, I kind of got ahead of myself. So let me come back to that in a sec. So EV certificates are issued by human verification. So there's a human at the CA. Could be documents, phone calls, that kind of thing. Uh, business, you need a government registered business name. The problem with it is it's expensive. And the other thing too is it can be vulnerable to social engineering. So someone can show up and say, oh, I work at Microsoft. I need a gift, I need a, a, a certificate for Microsoft, right? And then they'll, they have to try and figure out, oh, does this person actually work or are they pretending to work at Microsoft? And so there's an example of someone that was able to, uh, who is actually an ex-employee of Microsoft. So they might have got fired and they might have been mad about it. I don't know what, they, what the reason was exactly, but they still had their, presumably they still had their employee card or whatever it was. And so they were able to convince them to issue a certificate. In this case, it wasn't actually for HTTPS, it was for code signing. So they could sign software, but it's a similar kind of architecture. And if it worked for code signing, it could work for HTTPS as well. Okay, then uh, then we go to, okay, what, what does an EV certificate look like? How do you know you're on a website that has an EV as opposed to a DV? Now you can't really, unless if you go digging through the certificate details, but for a while they decided that uh, they would use green as a kind of visual uh, to represent it. So uh, different browsers would do it different ways. Uh, but basically, if you saw something in green, it meant it was a, an EV certificate. Um, other things they would do is they would put the company name. So instead of you going to twitter.com, well, it's X now, I guess, uh, it would be like X Inc, like the business, the registered business name. So it would show you that uh, detail as well. Okay. Like I said, they got rid of this. Why did they get rid of it? Do you think if you had to guess? Do you think users knew this? Do you remember this? Okay, if you went to a website tomorrow and it was green instead of gray, what would you think? Okay, <laughs> you either think the wrong thing or you think nothing at all, right? Or you don't even notice it, okay? And so that was the whole story there. It's just that users had no idea, uh, you know, they, they were at some website. Some of them knew enough to look for the lock, but like if it was a green lock or a gray lock, like who knows? like whatever, a lock is a lock, okay? So it just was kind of useless as a, as a distinguisher. Okay, so then uh, in the other way of doing it is these DV certificates. So this is where we just want the domain and we just want the key. We don't need all the business information and all the extra stuff to go with it. Okay, so for a DV certificate, what we want is we want it to be automatically issued by the CA. So you show up, you ask for the certificate, within a few minutes you should be able to walk away with the certificate. Okay, it's cheaper, uh, it's faster to obtain, you don't have to uh, have a human look at it so there's not a salary of a person at the CA that's job is to check out all these details. Um, and we're not checking the identity of the person that's asking, we're trying to figure out whether they actually can control the domain that they're asking for the certificate for. If they can demonstrate control over their domain, and we'll, we'll talk about what that means, but at a high level, if they can show that they, they control the domain, then we're going to assume that they're the owner of the domain, then we'll give them a certificate for that, for that domain. Okay. Um, now, because you're not checking anything beyond the domain itself, right? If let's say I go and I register google.com with three O's instead of two O's, and then I go and I ask for a certificate for google.com, right? Should I be able to get that certificate? So if I own the domain, right? Then that's all I'm showing here is just that this is a domain and I do own it. So yes, I'll get the certificate. So I can get a certificate for that website if I actually own it. And then the lock will appear. The lock won't say Google Inc, like the company in Mountain View, right? But do people check that in details? Probably not anyways, right? So they, if, if the URL was enough to trick them and then they were like, oh, is there a lock or not, right? Then they're, they're going to see the lock, okay? So important point as well is if you see the lock on a website, it doesn't mean anything about like this is a good website or it's vetted or it's secure. There's no malware on the website. It's a safe website to use. It doesn't mean anything about that, okay? The only thing the lock means is I have a secure tunnel from my browser to that website. The website could be malicious, okay? 
And now, now I gain my malware over a secure channel, right? Instead of over the public internet, but it doesn't matter at the end of the day, right? Um, so anyone can get a certificate for any site. It's not some sort of trusted thing. It's just, it's just literally about uh, this tunnel uh, that exists. The EV certificates at least would try to uh, limit it to like actually registered businesses and things like that. So the idea of them, when you saw the green was, it was actually meant to be, this is kind of more trusted than if you don't see the green uh, because it's at least tied to a company and things like that. Okay, so the question is now, how can we, I'm the CA, I'm staying at the CA and you come to me and say, you control concordia.ca and I wanna challenge you on it. And I want to challenge you in an automated way where I don't need humans. Okay. So how can I get you to demonstrate control over the domain? And there's three main ways uh, that, that are used. Okay. So one of them is based on email. One of them is based on you putting something on your website in a specific location. And then the other one is you putting something in your DNS record. Okay. So all three of them, most CAs offer all three of them. Uh, email is probably the most popular because it doesn't, it's the easiest to use, I would say. Uh, it doesn't involve like, like the DNS record thing, like it's sort of like you have to know what you're doing. And if you mess it up, it could have big consequences for your website. Um, so anyways, email is kind of like the, the path of least resistance. Okay, so I want to know whether you own Concordia.ca. I'm the CA. We're going to use email. And so this is what this is what the procedure looks like. Okay, you're going to first come to me and say, "I want a certificate. Uh, this is my public key and all the details. I want you to sign off on it." So I'll check, I'll go through your certificate request. I'll see that you're asking for a certificate about Concordia.ca. And so now my main question is, am I talking to the actual owner of Concordia.ca or am I talking to someone that's impersonating the owner? Okay. So my challenge, I'm going to challenge you basically to try and see whether you control the domain. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick a random number. I'm going to email it to admin at concordia.ca. All right. And what you're going to do is if you actually own concordia.ca, then you'll have access to that email account. You'll just open the email. The code will be there. You'll copy and paste it into the website or you'll just click a link. It will be embedded in the link. And then I see that you were able to reply to me with the code. And then now I believe that you have it and I'll sign off on it and I'll give you the certificate. Okay. Easy peasy. All right. So now from an attack tree perspective, okay, let's think about this procedure itself. Okay. Is there any vulnerabilities in this procedure itself or, or how would you go about if this is what it takes to get a certificate. Let's say you're not Concordia.ca, but you want the certificate for Concordia.ca. You know this is what all the CAs are going to do. What are you going to do to try to, to try and defeat uh, this process? Get access to Concordia email boxes. Okay. All right. So first thing is if I can get into a min at Concordia.ca, then I can break this process. Okay. How do I get access to that account? Okay. Okay. So, okay. Let me uh, phrase it differently. It, it, am I, is it a virtual thing? Like I'm going over the internet or is it like a physical thing? Okay. Okay. So it's actually both. So there's two ways of doing it, but let's start with the physical. So the first thing is if I can get access to the computer that's running the mail server for Concordia, right? Then I can get into that email account. Okay. How do I get access to it? Social engineering. I dress up like I don't know, a janitor or something like that. And I say, I have to clean the room. They leave me alone in there and then I, I, I do it. I don't know. Okay. Um, so, so that's, that's one way of doing it. And we'll come back to social engineering uh, later. The other is virtual. So I could just try to log in to admin at concordia.ca. What, what stops me from logging in? Probably a password. Okay. So basically this is actually interesting because we're doing all this like cryptography and we have public keys and all of that stuff. But if I know the one password to this one account, then I can get a certificate for it. Okay. So all this cryptography goes away. It all breaks just based on like the password to this account. Okay. So that's good. Any other ideas? So, okay. So how did the company know that 
this might be email to admin at concordia.ca. What if it's like Gmail and they just, anyone can register. If you go to gmail.com and you say, I want to be admin at gmail.com, right? Can you do that? Okay, so forget about certificate authority. Sorry, my question is different. Let's say I just, I, you know, I'm pulpspy at gmail.com, but instead I want to be a min at gmail.com. Can I just go and register that email? Why can't I? Okay, people are saying no. I haven't heard the right answer yet. Okay, okay. So we're relying on Google who makes Gmail to know that this is like a special email address and we shouldn't just hand it out. Okay? So that's fine. Is admin the only special email? Okay, where, where, where's the list? How many special emails are there? So you, you're setting up your own Gmail server. You're going to compete with Gmail. So you know I better not hand out admin or someone's going to, you know, someone's going to take my domain uh, or get a certificate for my domain. So that's fine. What, what are the, how do you figure out what the other ones are? Okay, so I don't know, right? But if you don't do it, right, then someone could go and they could register and get a certificate, okay? So that's another way to break it. Anything else? <coughs> okay, think about your, your man in the middle. Okay, so the email goes by. What what happens? Can you, can you is it encrypted? Yeah. Are emails encrypted when you send them? Okay, so I go to gmail.com. I have a lock, so when I'm looking at my inbox, that's encrypted. But when I hit send, and it goes, it has to go from Gmail's mail server to Concordia's mail server, right? Is that encrypted? I don't expect, again, I'm not asking this because I expect you to know the answer. I'm just open to guesses, right? Do people think it's encrypted or not? Okay. 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 Okay, so maybe it depends, SMTP, all right. So if it's not encrypted though, there's a problem, right? Then the adversary could just go in and, and reach uh, and grab the message out, okay? Now that email is going from the CA's mail server to, uh, to main.ca's server, okay? Uh, to main.ca, like there's a mail server sitting there at a certain IP address, right? How do you know that you're, how does the CA know that they're sending it to the right domain? Where did they get the IP address? How do they figure out where to send, how do, how do I send mail to admin at domain.ca at a like technical level? Like I have to send that email to an IP address. Where do I get that IP address from? DNS. Yeah. DNS, okay. So DNS records for domains will have what's called an MX record and it will say the, the, um, the IP address of the mail server. If the adversary could put their IP address in instead, then where's the mail going? Then it's going to the adversary, right? It doesn't matter if they know the password of the account or anything like that, it ends up on their server, right? And so they, they end up with the email, okay? Uh, so what protects your, why, why can't I go and change the MX record in your DNS? You own a domain, I wanna put my malicious mail server into your DNS, why can't I do that? Can I do it? It's protected by the user login for the provider, domain provider. Okay, okay. So when I registered that domain in the first place, I had to use GoDaddy or some domain registrar. When I did it, they made me make an account. So I have a username and password. Okay. Uh, and so that is what protects the MX record. Okay. So if you could figure out, oh, GoDaddy is domain.ca's domain register and you know the name of the, the, the account or whatever, like the account name, and you could guess the password, fish the password, keystroke log the password, shoulder surf the password, whatever, right? Then you can break into DNS, then you can change the MX record, then you can ask the CA for a certificate. They'll email you the code, you'll respond with it, and they'll say, yes, you are, and now you're walking away with a certificate. 
Okay, so that's another example where the entire system comes down to one password. Okay, the password on your DNS is, is also really important. Okay, so that's a pretty good list of attacks. Um, I'll go through them uh, sort of one by one, and, and I think we, we've seen all the ones that we talked about. Um, so as mentioned, if you have physical access to the mail server, uh, you could attack it that way. If you have remote password-based access, uh, then you could also uh, access it. So uh, if you could guess or steal the password for this email account. Okay, SMTP. So SMTP is the protocol that's used for sending mail between servers. So when I get the email, I'm either going over SSL to, to a web mail like Gmail, or if I use old fashioned email, I'm using something like POP3 or IMAP, those tend to have encryption. IMAP definitely has encryption, okay? So me accessing my inbox, that's generally encrypted. But for Gmail to send an email to Concordia, Gmail actually has the same problem that we're trying to solve, which is it doesn't know what Concordia's public key is, okay? Uh, and so if it were to encrypt it, for concordia.ca, it would first have to solve that problem of how do we figure out what public keys are, okay? Um, so what email opted to do, and this goes way back to the early days, is they decided first off just to not encrypt anything. Then they said, we're gonna use what we call opportunistic encryption. So basically what will happen is Gmail will say, I've never sent an email to concordia.ca. So they'll say, hey, Concordia, what's your public key? And Concordia will say, this is my public key. This is not happening over an encrypted channel. It can't because they don't have the public key yet. So this is happening over plain text, okay? Then Gmail will remember that public key and then it will use it all the time in the future, okay? Now, if the adversary is on the wire for that first interaction of, hey, what's your public key? The adversary can change it to their public key, okay? If they're not on the wire, then Google gets the right public key and because it's sticky, they kind of remember it for a while. And so the system will actually work until eventually it expires and then they have to ask again, okay? So this is not what we call end-to-end -end encryption. End-to-end -end encryption would be, it's encrypted from the sender, which is Google's mail server, all the way to Concordia's server. It's called, we call it opportunistic encryption because if the encryption is there, we use it. And if it's not there, we don't use it. And it's also, we call it trust on first use uh, because we trust on that first interaction when we ask for the public key, we get the right answer. Then we store it and we save it and then we use it on subsequent uses. If there's no trust on that first instance, then there's no trust on any future instances, okay? So it's kind of a complicated story, okay? But the moral of the story is that email you shouldn't think of as being encrypted, okay? There is encryption. The other compl complexity too is that it often doesn't encrypt all the way from mail server to mail server. It will kind of uh, encrypt it from one server to another server and then it will decrypt and then re-encrypt from that server to the next one. So we call this like link by link uh, encryption as well. Um, so, so anyway, so the, end, the, the moral of the story is that, that email is basically not encrypted, okay? If you want to use encrypted email, you have to do it yourself at the user level. So you'd have to use something like PGP or S-MIME. Uh, there will be support, like so once you set it up, but basically you have to get a certificate yourself to use it. You have to install it in your mail app and then you can end up using what's like actually end-to-end -end encryption. Um, but by default, uh, email is not encrypted. Oh yeah, and the other thing is you have to say that you want to do encryption and the adversary also has an opportunity to flip that as well. So if they see you asking Concordia, you know, I want to start doing encryption, they can just turn that to like, I don't want to do encryption. Um, but anyways. Okay, another thing we didn't explicitly mention, but you can always try and guess the secret number that the CA is putting into the email. And so these numbers have to be big and random and things like that. So it's usually an easy problem to solve, but that's, that's another vector. Okay, then for webmail, uh, for things like, like if you're trying to protect a domain that offers users to choose their own email addresses, you have to have that list of these are the special email addresses and make sure you don't hand them out, that you keep them for IT only. So a min is one, 
Does anyone know of any others? Okay, webmaster is another one, host name. So there's a couple of these, okay? But again, I want to emphasize that you have 600 CAs out there, okay? And they may have their own lists, okay? And if you don't know about the list that they're using, right, then you don't know to, serve, to save that like email address for yourself, okay? So one thing is admin, what's that short for? Administrator, okay, host name, uh, what was the other one? Web master, okay. Uh, what language are these three in? These are all English words, okay. Does a CA in another country that speaks another language, are they going to use admin? Are they going to use an English word? So they might, they might give you the opportunity, but they'll also give you the opportunity to use a different language, okay. So you, if you're Gmail, it's not enough to just reserve admin. You have to reserve like those kinds of words in all the languages that have country that are spoken in countries that have CAs, essentially. Okay, and so this ends up being a problem. Um, for example, there was just one CA in the world, and they accepted SSL certificates as that special uh, word, uh, and so. Uh, no one knew about it, and so Live.com is actually like Gmail, it's Microsoft's version, it used to be called Hotmail, and so it, someone went there and they said, I want to be SSL certificates at Live.com, and that wasn't on their list, and so they said, sure, go ahead, you can be SSL certificates at Live.com. Then they went over to the CA, and they said, you know, give me a certificate, and the CA, and the CA said, okay, where should I send it? Here's a drop-down menu, do you want it at admin, do you want it at host names? You wanted it at SSL certificates, and then they chose SSL certificates and ended up getting the email and ultimately ended up getting a certificate. And this is a certificate for all of live.com. Okay? So this is Microsoft, right? So this would be every other email user on Microsoft. If they were able to intercept their traffic, they now have a certificate, right? It could be for like software updates and other things that, that go along with Microsoft. I don't know what all they put on that domain, but it's a big deal to get a certificate for a major domain like that. Um, so anyways, I, I kind of Googled like, is there a list? And the answer is that there's basically not a, a great list. So this person is kind of like, uh, this was just on Stack Overflow or Stack Exchange and they, they just said, here's, here's a couple lists that people have come and here's like kind of the merge of all of them. So you can see there's about 10 uh, different different things. Notice SSL certificates not on this list because that was a weird corner case where it was literally the only CA out of 600 CAs that was using uh, that particular one. And they since like remove that as an option. And then if you want to be really sure, I found uh, on GitHub someone has a list of 1,250 email addresses that should be reserved by admins for security concerns. So anyways, that's sort of how bad it's gotten. So uh, you, you probably would want to use this kind of list. Okay, another thing you can do is you can try and attack the DNS. If you can get the mail server pointed at you, then that email is coming to you, okay? Uh, and so that's as simple as simple or as hard as setting what's called the MX record, mail exchange record, in the DNS record for the domain. Uh, how you do that, there's different ways. So you could try to attack DNS itself. So there's some caching and poisoning attacks on DNS. We don't have to go through the details of them. Uh, you can guess the password for their GoDaddy account or whoever it was. We're going to see that later. Uh, and, or you can also use social engineering. So you can call up Go, GoDaddy and say, oh, I own domain.ca. I forgot my password. Can you help me out? Right? And so I'll, we'll, I'll give you an example when we talk about social engineering. I'll give you an example of someone actually attacking the domain registrar, getting the password reset, and then what they were able to do with it, uh, which was bad. Okay, any questions about this email process? Okay, uh, the other two are, we'll just do really quickly because they, they kind of reduce, this is kind of like a super set of attacks. So almost the, the attacks that work on the other two are kind of like a subset of these attacks. So one thing I might do is instead of sending you an email, I might just say, okay, you own the domain, 
put your certificate request at this location. Put it in the root domain slash CR, CSR text on your website, okay? And then I'll go there and I'll try and fetch that website. And if I can fetch it and it matches the information that I'm seeing, uh, then I'm happy, okay? Now the problem is, uh, well, there's two problems with this that are kind of new. The first is, is the CA going to this over HTTPS or not? So we can't assume they are because the website's actually asking for a certificate. So that probably means they don't have a certificate already, okay? It might be a corner case where they have an a, a, like a expiring certificate and they're trying to roll it over so they have a certificate in place, but we need a process that works for some website that doesn't have a certificate in the first place, okay? So if the CA goes and grabs this over HTTP, what's the vulnerability? So the adversary's in the middle. First off, that file might not exist, and then the adversary just drops it in when they ask for it. Or the file exists and they change the key from the key that's in the file to their own key, okay? Um, then you can still attack it through DNS, right? <laughs> so if you can change the, the A record, in this case, the, the, the IP address of the domain and get it pointed to you, then you could put this file up on what's now your IP uh, server instead. And so like some of the other attacks uh, still work. And yeah, if you can log into the server. Also like some, like kind of like Gmail, there's some things like I don't know what a current example is, like get pages or something like that, where uh, there's websites that give you websites, right? So you can log in and register uh, and get a website and you can choose a custom domain and things like that. So if they give you a subdomain, as opposed to like, like they might give you like getpages.com slash something, or they might give you like something.getpages.com. If they give you a subdomain, then you might be able to actually put a file in that location. Right, and then you could go and get a certificate. And that may not be a bad thing, like maybe, like get pages actually want you to get certificates for your subdomain, uh, which is fine. But, but anyway, so, so you have to think too about who is it that can put that file in that location in your organization, and, and who can touch the computer, like the bare metal computer that's hosting this, because if they can put this file uh, that way, it could also get put there. And then uh, DNS is another way. So I might say, oh, you, you own this domain? Good. I'm going to challenge you to change your DNS record to something that I recognize, and then that will prove to me that you own this domain. Okay? And so there's two ways. I could give you like a random string to put in your DNS record. Uh, so there's a text field where you can kind of stuff anything. Or you could actually put your certificate request. It's too big to fit, but you could hash it, and then you could put that in your domain record. And then I'll go and I'll check it, and then when I get it, um, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll see that it matches, okay? And so this one's actually kind of nicer because you're not involving email, you're not involving fetching things over the internet, but the CA does have to get your right DNS record, okay? So DNS is not fetched over an encrypted channel. So if the adversary is between the CA and their DNS resolver, right, then you can, you can intercept it. If I can take over your DNS record, then I can change the key to my key. Uh, and if I can do any kind of caching, poisoning attacks, that kind of thing, okay? Any attack that I would use on this also would work on HTTP or also on email as well. Okay, uh, questions about, about these processes or the attacks on the processes? Okay, good. All right, let's uh, take a 10 minute break and then we'll, uh, we'll pick it up. Okay, so there were a bunch of questions. Some, about three or four people asked more or less the same question about the assignment, so I'll just state it clearly. Uh, when you come up with your criteria, so security, usability, deployability criteria, it's not specific to the three systems I gave you, okay? So you're trying to come up with criteria that's for all ticketing systems. Like, these are six properties that you would want to have in any ticketing system, okay? So think of it like you don't have to do this, but you can you could think like chronologically, I first come up with the columns, then I hand you the three systems and you're like, okay, now I'm gonna evaluate them, okay? Obviously you can look at the systems to try and figure out what the differences are and it will give you ideas about what the security properties should be or the usability or the deployability, okay? But they're not, in that question two and three, it's not specific to the three systems I gave you, they're just general properties for all ticketing systems. Good properties to have for any ticketing system. Okay. 
OK, so we'll, uh, we'll go back to the lecture. All right, so we went through three ways to automatically issue uh, a, a certificate. So we answered the first question of how Alice knows the public keys of the certificate authority so it's on their computer. Uh, the second question is, uh, how does the CA know the key of the website? So it does one of these things, either an in-person EV certificate or some sort of automated email, API web, or DNS challenge. And then the final question is, uh, why can't, if the CA can do this, why doesn't the user just do it themselves? Then we don't need CAs, right? Okay. Can everyone quiet down, please? There's a lot of chatter still. Um, okay, so why, why can't Alice just do this? Okay, so the answer is like, it's basically just one of scalability, okay? Um, so if Alice were to do business documents and phone up every website, if you do have to do that with every website you visit, that obviously doesn't work, okay? So it's easier for like, I trust my computer, Apple somehow knows uh, Komodo, and Komodo did this process with this company. So it is a kind of chain of trust, uh, but it, it sort of reduces the work for everyone. Same thing with email. If I go to a website, I could be like, and the website says, I go to Concordia for the first time, it says this is my public key, and I say, okay, I'm gonna send you a, an email at admin at concordia.ca and make sure that this is actually your public key. I could do that in theory, it's just, it would, then it, it would take me a long time because I have to wait you know, for them to answer the email and all that stuff, right? Uh, so it just, it, it just wouldn't work very well, okay? It's easier to have a CA do it once, the CA does it, and then, then users don't have to do it at all, okay? Same thing with the website. Um, the website's a little more complicated because uh, if they could put their certificate out of file. Like, let's say that, that every website, it was just universal that if you wanted their public key, it would always be at domain slash public key dot text. Okay, that could just be a universally held standard. The problem is because I'm fetching that before I know what the key is, I'm by definition fetching it over HTTP. And so I, any adversary in the middle can immediately change that value. Okay, so that basically doesn't work. It, it would require the thing that you, you're checking in order to work. So there's a sort of circular dependency. And then the last one is DNS, okay? Now DNS is actually a, a different story, I would argue. I would argue that with DNS-based validation, you actually more or less could check, um, you could basically get rid of CAs, okay? <clears throat> the problem with DNS is it's also not encrypted, okay? So if the adversary's in the middle and I ask, DNS, what's concordia.ca, I'm already asking them for their IP address. So I'm already going there anyway. I'm not doing anything special. It's no extra communication. I'm getting that IP address back. And then if I just say, well, give me the, the certificate as well, then I get the certificate. And then I don't even have to ask this, the, the website for the certificate, right? So I save a round of communication with the website about what their certificate is. And I'm doing it by getting something that I'm getting anyways over DNS. The only problem with that story is that if the adversary is between me and DNS, right, it's the same thing, they can change it. Because are DNS queries encrypted? They're not, okay? Now, we don't need encryption. Encryption is about hiding information. What we need is integrity. So even if I could just get it, like say it was signed, the DNS record, if I could get a signed DNS record, then, then this whole system would work. Uh, everyone could just put their key in their DNS record and we could just get rid of CAs entirely. Okay, so is it possible to get DNS records that are signed? So the answer is yes, there is a standard for it called DNSSEC, which is the secure version of DNS. <coughs> it's, uh, sorry, just give me a sec. <coughs> uh, it's even deployed, so it does exi exist today. There are CAs that are signing these DNS records. It has its own kind of like CA thing, so you don't, completely get rid of CAs because now the CAs are just on the DNS side instead of being on the HTTPS side. Um, the problem with it, we saw it actually because we noted it when we were talking about amplification attacks, uh, denial of service attacks, if you remember, is the query, what's Concordia's IP address, now comes with a certificate and signatures and maybe a chain of certificates and it's a lot of data, right? So 
DNSSEC is just not that like, and you, you're hitting DNS a lot because every time you go to a website, it's not just the website you're going to, it's like all the other websites that it's pulling resources from. And so if you start passing around certificates with all of this information, it just kind of becomes sort of like a nightmare uh, in terms of deployability. So DNSSEC is out there, but not everyone uses it. So it's sort of there. But anyways, if we, if we could do it, uh, then we could uh, put keys into DNS records. There's also a standard for that called DANE, uh, Domain Authenticated Name Entities, I think, or something like that. And, uh, and so that also exists. So we could basically push a button and get rid of all CAs, okay? So the answer to why Alice can't use the same method is for most of them, it's just an efficiency thing. Uh, and then for DNS, it's sort of a special case of if we could, the other thing about DNS is it's who, like, who do you use as your DNS provider? So right now I'm on Concordia, I'm on the Wi-Fi. Where's my DNS going? Okay, and why? Like how? How? Why did? When did I decide that that's where I want to, it to go? Okay, okay. So so when I connect to the Wi-Fi router, it actually tells me. It says, here's the DNS record. I can override it if I want. So some people do, they like Google because it's fast. So if you put 8.8.4.4 8, 8 .4 and 8.8.8.8 .8 as your primary secondary DNS, then it will go to Google instead. Um, but otherwise you're just getting the DNS from you. Concordia probably runs their own resolver, okay? Uh, meaning that they're the first stop, like DNS is sort of this big complicated system, but they're kind of like the first stop. So the adversary would basically have to be very close to you, okay? If the adversary is attacking me going to Google, they can be anywhere from me to Google. But to attack my DNS queries, they'd have to be very close. They'd have to be on the Wi-Fi router or they'd have to be in Concordia's infrastructure. Once my packets kind of leave Concordia, it's too late to attack DNS, okay? So it's better, it's a shorter path to get a DNS record than it is to get something from a website. Um, so anyway, that's another argument for doing Dane, even if you don't have DNSSEC. But if you have DNSSEC, then it resolves the problem, but we don't have DNSSEC, blah, 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 blah. So we're stuck with uh, CAs. Okay, so the big lessons that we can take away from this whole CA model or the PKI is, the first thing is that certificate authorities aren't actually any different than you or me. So uh, Komodo does not know what Concordia's public key is any better than you or me, okay? They have to figure it out. They have to use DNS. They have to send emails or things like that, okay? So there, usually we use the word authority when you're authoritative over something, but certificate authorities aren't actually authoritative over anything. If you wanted to start a company and be a certificate authority, no one's going to say you can't do that because you don't have special information or you don't know the right people and whose keys belong to who. No one knows whose keys belong to who. Right? They, just, they just do this protocol back and forth, okay? So all CAs are, are, there are a bunch of companies that are set up that know how to do this protocol, and that's it. They don't have any other special knowledge, okay? So they're not, they're not actually like special companies, and that's probably why there's 600 of them, okay? Because if you wanna make money, the other thing is certificates cost money, even the automated ones. Usually, there are companies now like Let's Encrypt uh, that, that will give you a free one, um, but traditionally they cost money, and since you don't have to be, you don't have to do anything special to be a CA, then it's kind of like free money. If you, if you have the infrastructure in a company already, uh, you're already in the tech space, you might as well start a CA uh, to do it. Um, the other sort of, uh, sort of counterintuitive thing that I mentioned is that HTTPS is this, you know, it's a cryptographic protocol, right? Like sometimes people think about the web and they're like, oh, we use a lot of passwords and stuff like that. You know, and if you go back to like the early like 80s or 70s and people were envisioning what the web would look like, everyone thought it would look more like HTTPS where we'd have keys and certificates and, you know, you wouldn't type a password into a website, you would actually, you would secure both ends of the tunnel. So not just you would have a certificate at the one end of the tunnel, you would have your own personal certificate and you would be using it to secure the other end of the tunnel. Now the website knows who you are, you know who the website is, there's no logins, there's no cookies, there's no sessions or anything like that. It's just pure cryptography, right? That was the vision. But we see that even in the sort of half cryptography we have, there's a lot of ways of attacking it if you know the right passwords. 
If I know the password to admin at domain.ca, I get to set the key to be whatever I want, right? If I can get your DNS key, or sorry, password, uh, then I can, I can attack the system as well, okay? And there's also a lot of reliance on other things, like CAs kind of push the problem onto DNS, because if DNS doesn't work right, then the whole CA validation doesn't work right either, right? Or they push it onto HTTP, or they push it onto email, right? So CAs are really kind of ridiculous companies because they're, they're, they're not even like, they don't know anything special, they're using protocols, but they're using them in a way that they're trusting that the other protocols work. So all these other protocols are kind of doing the heavy lifting uh, for CAs. Okay, so we can kind of stuff this into uh, our attack tree. Um, so remember, the, the high level was we're trying to get the tunnel pointed at us. Okay, so this is sort of the subtree of getting the tunnel pointed at us. So what we can do is we can try and get a, an actual CA signed certificate. So we'll call that a valid certificate. Now, there might be other ways to get the, the tunnel pointed at us without attacking a CA. Okay, we're going to consider those next. Okay, but for now, if we want to attack a CA in order to get the tunnel pointed at us, we could try and break into the CA. Okay, so there are examples of CAs that someone just hacked them. We don't know exactly how, and they just got, they were issued certificates. They got caught because Chrome caught them because they were impersonating Google, and then uh, different things happened to the CA. Some of them went out of business. Some of them, people said they were too big to fail. Uh, you can look at the issuing process, so how you prove that you should be issued a certificate. You can try and hack it. So you could try and attack the personal validation through social engineering or the automated, so the email based. So these are the attacks. You just saw them as slides, so I won't go through them. Uh, and then these two were the other two that were similar uh, to email. So I did fill out the tree for, for all of them, but you could fill them out. Okay, we saw earlier that you could, uh, if you're a government uh, and you have a CA that's operating within your legal jurisdiction, you could just go to the CA and say, I just made a law that says, or I have a judge uh, court order that says that you have to give me your key, and then you can get, or you have to give me a certificate for Google, they'll give you a, a Google certificate, and then you go and you can intercept traffic. Um, there's other things we didn't talk about, uh, but um, sometimes when you get like antivirus software, it might actually do the man in the middle attack on you, as they say it's as a service to you, uh, because otherwise they wouldn't be able to inspect your traffic because it's encrypted. So what they'll do is they'll basically, you go to google.com, your antivirus will create a fake google.com certificate uh, on your computer, right? It will terminate the tunnel at it, it will inspect your traffic, then hopefully it re-encrypts it and sends it off to Google, but you actually don't know anything about that second leg. Like you don't know whether it's doing it right or if your anti-software, antivirus software is out of date, then maybe it's using an old version of SSL. Like you, you really don't know anything about it. So actually some people at Concordia, uh, Manon, who, Professor Manon, who you might know from other courses, he did a big study of all the software and saw all sorts of problems uh, when you do it. Uh, the other thing is that some people like, like parents that have kids, they might put like parental control apps. So it's the same idea, it's doing content inspection. And then some organizations will as well. They'll say, we're gonna give you a laptop, but we have this like monitoring software that's on your laptop. And what it's actually doing is it's snipping all your SSL connections in the middle, looking at the traffic and then re-encrypting it on the way out, okay? And so the way it's doing it is basically, it's basically putting a new root certificate into your root store. So now instead of those 50 companies, you have 51, which includes this software. And then it's on the fly, it's creating certificates, fake certificates, signing it with the new route that you installed on your computer, and then it's able to, to inspect your traffic. Oh yeah, and then there was, there was some, some of these companies that offered this software got big enough that they said, it's kind of messy, like the user installs us and then we have to go and put a root certificate what if we could just get a CA to give us a certificate, like an issuing certificate, then we wouldn't have to mess around with people's root stores. And so some people, when they looked at the software, they found out that uh, some of them were actually coming with certificates already. So they didn't even have to put a custom root in, the, in your root store. They just already had that power from some CA that signed off on them being an intermediary CA. Anyways, they got caught and then they got, a lot of them got like removed and there, there was a big, Fewer over that uh, when it was discovered. 
Okay, uh, qu questions about any of this so far? Okay. All right, so now let's uh, pick up the story where uh, we're, so this whole subtree was about obtaining a valid certificate, but I, I didn't really define what a valid certificate means. What does it mean to be a valid certificate? And then maybe there's other ways of using in different flavors of invalid certificates uh, to attack the system, okay? So what happens is uh, you go to a website and you basically, this is unencrypted, okay? There's an adversary, they're reading everything, and you just say, I want to talk HTTPS, okay? And they'll say, fine, I have a certificate, I have a chain, it should chain back to a root uh, that you have, so here it is, look at it, and if you're happy, then we can start negotiating the encryption. Okay, so what your browser will do is it will download this certificate chain and it's going to like do a bunch of basic checks, okay? So the first thing it will do is it will say, all right, do I actually know the CA that signed this certificate? Are they a root certificate in my store or do they chain back through a bunch of CAs and eventually end up as a root certificate on my, in my store? It's really basic, but let's say I'm uh, adversary, an adversary and I have a certificate for adversary.com and you're going to google.com and I say, oh, I have a valid certificate because I can have a, if I own adversary.com, I can have a certificate for adversary.com, right? What if I just drop that in and say, here's my Google certificate, and then it comes back to you? You have to check that the certificate actually matches the website that you're trying to visit. Uh, another thing is, let's say that you go and you get a certificate. So you, you have your certificate for domain.ca, okay? Uh, we saw that there's these intermediary certificates, right? And they can issue certificates, okay? So if you get a certificate for your domain, can you be an intermediary and then issue certificates to other domains? So the answer should be no, right? It's like when, when I give you your certificate, it's like it's for your use only. You can't, ish, you can't use it to issue new certificates, okay? But certificates all look the same. It's just a bunch of information that's signed by some certificate authority. You go to that certificate authority, they have a bunch of information that's signed by someone else. Like these certificates all look the same. There's no, like the, 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 a site certificate, a certificate for a website and a certificate for a CA, like they don't look any different, okay? So what we need is we need a flag somewhere in the certificate that basically says, this certificate's allowed to issue new certificates or this, is, this certificate is not allowed to, okay? So it's called the basic constraints. Uh, the flag is called CA and so uh, if you're a CA, like an intermediary, you need a certificate that's signed where that flag is set to true. And if it's set to false, that means it's a site certificate, and so you can't use it. <coughs> so this is what it looks like. So uh, on the uh, left-hand side, uh, you can see for Concordia's LEAF certificate or site certificate, there's a, a field called basic constraints and CA set to be uh, no, which means false. And then if we move up the certificate chain to the intermediary certificate and we find the same field in it, uh, you can see that it's set to true or yes, okay? Um, so, so anyway, so that's another check that you wanna check is that all the things that are CAs in this chain are actually have that flag set to be true. Then there's this idea that uh, certificates don't last forever. So usually a certificate has a shelf life of one to two years now. It used to be a lot longer, but, but people, because of data breaches and things like that, people, CAs have become more conservative. Uh, so they issue them with shorter uh, time periods. Um, and there's also a concept of, let's say that you lose the private key that goes along with your public key, right? If the adversary has the private key that goes with your public key, they are you as far as SSL is concerned, right? Um, so they can, they can break into any, uh, any tunnel um, or, or set up a, a tunnel that points at them. Um, so you might realize that your key got lost or maybe you did something dumb with it, like it accidentally went on a computer that it shouldn't have. You're not sure whether it was lost, but it was in a vulnerable state and you wanna be safe, right? We need a way to like cancel a certificate, all right? So we call that revocation. Um, so that's another thing. Uh, you, you might ask yourself is how does that whole cancellation or revocation of certificates 
uh, work. And then when you get a certificate, you also have to ask yourself, is it revoked or not? Because if it's been revoked, it might be because it's a stolen certificate. Okay, and so this is going to stop adversaries from, from using the certificates that they steal, or at least for a certain amount of time. Uh, they, they'll have a small time window before it, it gets revoked. Okay, so I'll tell you some stories about things that went wrong uh, with these five checks. And they, they vary a lot, like in terms of, like some are technical, some are, are social or whatever. Okay. So the first one is an implementation error. So this is a software error. The software happens client side on Apple computers only. So it was in the operating system. The operating system has libraries that create the, the cryptography. Uh, it's called Secure Transport in Apple. Uh, and it has all the TLS stuff. All the certificate checks and stuff would be handled by this library. So this is the library that's going to do the certificate checks. Okay, And it was just a pure software bug. It's not nothing wrong with the protocol itself. It was just how it was implemented. So this is like highly like simplified code. Um, but basically, the way it worked is like this. Um, they wanted to do a bunch of checks. So there was a bunch of conditions. So let's say there were four conditions, like does the certificate match the website? Is it revoked? Is it expired? You know, it was going through all the checks on the previous screen. OK. And what they were doing is they had a variable. Uh, and they, based on when you reach the end of the, the thing, depending on what's in the variable, you would decide whether it passed or not. OK. So if you can reach the end of the code and have a 0 sitting in this check variable, then we're going to assume that everything's OK. But if it ever gets flipped to a 1, then we're going to assume that there was an error, and then we're not going to we're not going to show the lock, or we're going to warn the user, or whatever we decide to do. Okay, so the code worked like this. It just said um, uh, check this condition. Okay, uh, if it fails, I I wonder if this slide's wrong. Actually, now let me. Oh yeah, sorry, sorry. Okay. Um, OK, so what we do is we check the condition, and we write the outcome of the condition into check. OK, so it's either a 0 or 1. And then we ask ourselves, is it a 1? Uh, so if, it's, if this condition passes, a 0 gets written into here, then, then it's not a 1. OK? Uh, and if, it's, uh, if it is equal to 1, OK, then this whole thing is true. OK, this if statement is true, then we execute go to fail. Okay, and the idea of this is that once we find, once basically once something doesn't pass, then there's no point in checking the rest of it. We might as well just skip to the end. Okay, so then we go to fail, and then fail just returns the value in check. So we only go to fail if check equals one. So we'll always be returning a one. If it's not a one, right? Then uh, then we skip this line because the if statement doesn't hold, and we go to the next thing. So we take condition two, we dump it into check, we ask whether we failed. If we did, we go to fail. If we didn't fail, then we go to the next line. Okay? And we keep going through it. Okay? So this is basically the architecture of the code, although it was actually more complicated if you look at it. Okay? Now this code is fine. There's no there's no problem with this code at all. Okay? It's kind of like go to is kind of like not people don't like it so much, because uh, you can there's, there's a bunch of issues that you could run into uh, using go-to's. Um, so it's not like a preferred method. But at the same time, it's not vulnerable. It, it works. It does what it's supposed to do. Okay. Now, there was a problem with the code. It's not on the slide yet, but I'll show it to you. So the problem was that in one of these checks, there was an extra go-to fail. Okay. How did it get there? I don't know. If you've ever used get and there's like commit like merge errors. Sometimes you get like duplicates of lines. Maybe that's how it got there. Maybe someone really smart put it there because they thought it was very subtle uh, in terms of, of what it did. I don't know. No one knows why it got there. OK, but it was there. Uh, it looks like some dumb human error, but anyways, it was. OK, so what happens in this case? So let's say we get to condition one and we pass condition one. OK, we go to condition two, all right? If we fail condition two, then this is true. Then we're going to go to fail. Okay. What if we pass condition two? What happens? 
Okay, why, why do we always go to fail? Because the line outside the equally. Okay, okay. So this is like supposed to be C, like modeling C or something like that. So the if only applies to the next line of code, okay? If we had a curly bracket here and a curly bracket after the second go to fail, no problem. No problem. Okay? Uh, if this was like some languages use indents to actually mean something, right, kind of like a curly bracket, then there wouldn't be a problem with it. But in this case, there's a problem with it. Okay, so we always go to fail, all right? We always go to fail when we hit this line of code, okay? Now, what if there's a problem in condition three? So let's say condition three would reach false. What would happen in this, in this code? So we have passed condition one, so we would skip over go to fail, right? We would pass condition two, so we would skip over the first go to fail. Then we would hit the second go to fail and actually go to fail. So we would skip checking conditions three and four. What's sitting in the return variable check? Zero, right? Because the last thing we checked didn't flip it to a one. Okay, so does the whole process return I passed or a fail? I pass, right? Okay. So the whole thing says I pass, even if I fail condition three or four because conditions three and four are never checked, okay? What if condition three were, does the website certificate that, does the website in the certificate that you're getting actually match the website you're trying to visit? Then you would just skip over that condition. You'd never check it, okay? So what does that mean? That means I'm adversary. I have a certificate for evil.com. I see you going to google.com. I just drop in a certificate for evil.com, okay? It's signed by CA. That's kind of like condition one. It traces back to a root. That's condition two. It totally doesn't match. It's a totally wrong certificate. It's not even for the right website, but that's in condition three, and condition three is never being reached, okay? So it just skips over. So that's what happened, literally, okay? Um, so this stuff was unreachable. There's no way for the... It doesn't matter what path you follow you'll never execute uh, these lines of codes. Those conditions weren't being checked, and uh, those conditions implemented some like serious checks, including whether the domain of the certificate matches uh, the domain that you're visiting. Okay. Um, now, after this happened, uh, people are like, um, uh, obviously you need to write better code, whatever, Apple's bad, so they fixed it really fast, uh, that type of thing. Then a bunch of companies came and said, hey, we have these static analysis tools. And we took your code, because it was open source, and we ran it through our static analysis, and it said there was an error. Like, what's wrong with the people at Apple? You know, why, why aren't they running their stuff through static analysis? If they did, they would have caught this error before it happened, okay? Now, what they don't tell you is that, yes, it probably caught this error, but it probably caught another 10,000 things that weren't errors, right? And so you need an engineer to sit there and sort out of these 10,000 things that this tool is telling me, which one is actually the error and which one isn't, okay? So that's why static analysis is sometimes used to some extent, but a lot of times it isn't relied on solely uh, by companies, especially with big complicated code bases, is because it generates too many false positives that you can't, you're already looking for a needle in this haystack trying to, to find the actual true positive amongst all the false positives. Um, the other thing people said is you should have, you should have just thrown bad certificates at the library and seen what happened. If you did that, then one basic bad certificate you might make is like a certificate where the domain doesn't match then you would see that the library would accept it and then you would know that there was a test. And so this is legitimate. Apple absolutely should have done this. So we call this unit testing and uh, it's a good practice, right? Anytime you write something and you want to test it is create a bunch of test scenarios, some of them that should be accepted, some of them that should be rejected and make sure that the library is actually doing what you think it should. And then what people did is they, uh, academics, they took it a step further and they said, we're going to use like fuzzing techniques. So we're going to make millions of certificates and they're going to be wrong in really subtle ways, like weird parsing issues or um, like, I, I don't know, like things that don't even look like certificates and things like that. We're just going to throw them as fast as we can at the library. And if it ever like w behaves weirdly, then we'll like kind of zero in on it. And so when you fuzz the library like this, then they, they realize that there's all sorts of vulnerabilities. Um, that are, are, are way more subtle than the ones that, that we saw in GoToFail. 
Uh, but, but anyway, so that, that was also like a kind of research in, endeavor. So now things like OpenSSL, Secure Tunnel, Microsoft's equivalent, I think it's called S-Tunnel, um, sorry, Secure Channel and S-Tunnel. Anyway, all these libraries are, are pretty hardened today. Uh, so like most people have, have tried everything they can think of uh, because it's, they, they realize it was really important to, to test these libraries. Okay, so that's, that's sort of the, the moral of the story. Okay, here's, here's another story. Um, so I asked this question earlier. So you go and you get a certificate. I have a certificate for popspy.com and I just pretend I'm a CA. So I just go out and I start issuing Google certificates, Facebook certificates. I set the key to whatever I want. And then I see a user that's going to Google and I drop my certificate chain in instead. It does chain from google.com to my certificate and my certificate is valid, right? And it chains from my certificate through my chain back. Okay, so the chain is intact. There's no problem with the chain. The problem is that when I have my certificate, the CA that gave it to me, they set that flag of whether I'm a CA or I'm allowed to be a CA or not, they set it to false, okay? But the software has to check it. If the software doesn't check it, then I could potentially do this attack, okay? So um, this should be set in all site certificates and software should check it, but did it always check it? And so the answer is no. Um, so early, in the early days of, of Microsoft uh, Internet Explorer, I didn't check this. So there's a security researcher, uh, Moxie Marlinspike, who did a bunch of stuff on, um, on SSL. But anyways, he, he found this vulnerability. They weren't checking it, so they were fine. Everyone kind of laughed about it and said, Microsoft's dumb. You know, it's one of the most basic things. So Microsoft fixed it, and everyone's like, we'll never do this again, right? Then Apple decided, hey, it'd be cool to have a phone, right, an iPhone. So they came out with the iPhone. And oh, we have to do a whole operating system. It's not, we're not gonna use Mac OS or OS X on our phone. We're gonna have a brand new operating system. We have a brand new operating system. We're gonna have a brand new SSL library. And so guess what happened? They, uh, they did the exact same mistake, okay? They didn't check that uh, site certificates were actually CAs, were, had that CA flag set to false. So anybody could just start issuing certificates for any website and the early versions of iOS would uh, accept it. Then people are like, oh, if, okay, Microsoft's dumb, Apple's dumb, it won't happen again. Then all these IoT devices started coming out, right? And again, you have your own operating system, you have your own stack, you do SSL from scratch, and then this bug creeped in. So I don't have a news article to represent it, but there's, there's like 20 or so devices that had the exact same vulnerability, okay? But it won't happen again, okay? Nobody is ever gonna, we learned our lesson, right? It happened three times, that's, that's it. Okay, another thing you could do is you could just drop in a certificate that's completely invalid. Okay, so someone's trying to go to facebook.com and you're the government uh, and so you could just make up a facebook.com that doesn't even trace back to a root certificate. Okay, so you don't even try. You just drop it in and what happens? What happens if you get a certificate chain and it doesn't trace back to a root certificate? Does it show you the lock or not? So it's not going to throw a lock. Is it going to throw an error? Yes. And what's the error going to say? Okay, yeah, this certificate authority, like this, this certificate does not trust, trace back to a trusted root certificate in your certificate store. Do you want to go ahead anyways? Do you want to visit the website? Yes or no? What do you think people are going to do? They're going to Facebook, they see this like error message about certificates and certificate authorities and roots and things like that. And they want to go to Facebook and the browser's asking them, do you actually want to go? Yes or no? What are they going to do? Yes. They're going to click yes, right? And then they end up on the website and now it's a completely wrong certificate, right? Um, okay, so, so you would see something like this. Uh, there's a problem with the website certificate, blah, 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 blah. You can click here to close the website or you can continue to the website. Oh, it's not recommended, right? But you, know, you just do one click and then the, the whole problem goes away, okay? So some, some people ran a user study on this kind of warning. So this, this is a few years ago. I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, but, but basically, like, in their, in their um, uh, research group, 
uh, it wasn't like 100% went through, but like 50% went through. Okay, so you're not going to get everyone, but if you're a government and you're spying on everyone that's going to Facebook, even if you can get 50% of the people to accept it, then that's fine, right? You still have a lot of things that you can spy on. So because of this problem, then uh, people like including engineers at Google, they said, okay, this is, this is actually a big problem. This is a big usability problem, right? If the usability is off, then the security is off as well. And so now we're going to do two things. First thing we're going to do is we're going to really try and simplify the language. Okay, we're not going to talk about certificates and certificate authorities and things like that. Okay, we're just going to say, hey, your connection, it's not private. There's attackers, they might be trying to steal your information like passwords, messages, or credit cards. Okay, the second thing they're going to do is they're going to make it really hard to click through. They're still going to give you the option. Okay, so ultimately there will be a way to click through to the website, but it's not going to be as simple as yes, I want to go anyways, or no, I'm not going to want to go. Okay, so for example, in Chrome, you see there's a back to safety button that's like no, and but there's no like I want to go to the website, at least on that screen, but then you can click advanced and then it displays even more information. Uh, and then it, it has a link here, uh, proceed to it unsafe. So you sort of have to click a few times to get to uh, to get past the error, and then the, the language was simplified. So they, they, they tested it, also did user studies, and they found that, that it was way more effective. I forget what the numbers were, but the number of people that clicked through went from 50% to 2% or something like that. Um, we, can, we can actually just try it. Uh, so, so this bad SSL is a, a nice website. It has basically everything that you might want to do that's kind of broken about SSL. We saw it already. Uh, we looked at something else. I can't remember what now. But anyways, if we want to go to, so this would be a self-signed certificate. So self-signed just means you sign it yourself. You don't get a CA to sign it. Um, so this is what would happen. So in Safari, it says this connection is not private. This website may be impersonating the website to steal your personal or financial information. You should go back to the previous page, show details or go back. Okay. Uh, so again, this is like, this is way better language than certificates and authorities and roots. If I click on show details, then it says why it's warning you. It basically warns you a bit more. And then eventually you can actually visit the website. Then there's another warning saying, are you sure you want to go to this website even though it's not private? And then eventually I get through. And I think, because I tried this before, there was even an additional one where they wanted me to like authorize this certificate and put in my root store or something like that. Um, but I, I did it already, so I think that's why it went through. I've seen that dialogue before. But anyways, the, the, the point being that it's a lot harder to just kind of click through and squash, squash these warnings and, and not pay attention to them anymore. Okay, um, here's another example. Uh, so this is also like, this is like kind of a very convoluted implementation. I wouldn't even call it a flaw, uh, but it's just, it was something that wasn't really well thought through, but I thought it was kind of fun. This is also from Moxie Marlin Spike. Um, okay, so when you go to a CA and you say, I want a certificate, you have to tell them what certificate you want it. I, I want it for concordia.ca. Right, uh, so that's fine. Or let's say I want it for, for Google.com. Okay, but anyways, the, the 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 site that you're requesting the certificate for, the URL, it has to be part of the request to it. Okay, so what he did is he realized that um, I'm going to uh, look in the certificate request. I'm going to I'm the CA. I'm going to pull out the domain that they want. Then I'm going to send an email to it. So I'm going to send a min at that domain and I'm going to send the email off to it. Okay. So I sort of have to explicitly like copy and paste the address in the request into my email. Okay. And so the question becomes what happens if there's like weird, like kind of special characters or things like that in the, if it's not a well formed uh, domain name that you're requesting. Okay. So the example that's easiest to understand, there's a lot of them. Um, uh, has to do with a null character being inserted in the middle, okay? So the example would be you go to a CA and you say, I want a certificate for google.com null.concordia.ca, okay? 
So the CIA has to look at this thing and try and figure out what domain. That's not a valid domain. You can't go to that domain because null character is not allowed. Okay. So it's going to maybe notice that this isn't a valid string, but then it has to decide what am I going to do with it. Okay. So it could just throw it away and say, you can't ask me for something else that's, that's invalid. Okay. That would be a great response. Okay. But the way that software libraries are written, they might not have anticipated that someone's going to try this. And so they might not have, have like built in that kind of functionality. Okay. So the, the library might try and do different things. Okay. So there's, there's basically like three ways of, of doing this. One way is that you just throw it away. You say, I don't, there's a character there that I don't recognize. It's completely invalid. You know, I'm, I'm not going to go any further. The second thing you might do is you might scrub it. So you might go through it and say, is there any special characters that I don't recognize? Yeah, there are. I'm just going to drop them. Okay. Now you are left with what happens if you drop the null character? What are you left with? Okay, google.com.concordia.ca. Is that a valid domain? No. So it's, is it a valid subdomain? Could you have like a website that was at google.com.concordia.ca? Okay, people are saying no, but there's no reason why you can't, right? You can have mail.concordia.ca. You could, why can't you have com.concordia.ca? Why can't you have google.com.concordia.ca? Okay, so there's no, yeah, so, so it is a subdomain of concordia.ca, but there's no reason why you can't. You can name your subdomains anything you want. Okay, so that, that is a valid domain. Okay, Concord, google.com.concordia.ca could be a valid domain. You could set that up. Okay, but who is it that owns that domain? Does Google own that domain or does Concordia own that domain? Concordia, right? So it's a subdomain of Concordia. Just like images.concordia.ca, mail.concordia.ca, google.com.concordia.ca. It looks weird, but there's nothing invalid about it. It's just a subdomain of concordia.ca. So if a CA drops the null character and then they send the email, where's the email going? And then at, they, they might just send it to concordia.ca, usually the super domain. And, and, and so in any case, whether they send it to the subdomain or not, Concordia would be able to answer that email. Okay. All right. Now, there's a third thing. What's another thing that, that dumb software might do if it encounters this string? Other than reject it entirely or, or drop the character that it doesn't recognize. Okay, allow it is fine. So that's, uh, I guess, a fourth case. In this case, it won't work because the email will reject it. It will get rejected somewhere else. Except, uh, on the null, uh, take okay, why would you cut on the null? So it's true. Okay, so, so it could be an error case. Like, I don't recognize it, so I, I, it throws an error or something, and then I end up cutting it. Is there any other reason why you might cut? Is anyone programmed in C? Has anyone heard of uh, null terminated so, strings? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, what's a null terminated string? Does it doesn't matter if you know. Okay, if I'm coding in Java, Java is like very verbose. They like to tell you all the things about it. So they'll say, there's a string variable, the type of the variable is string, the length of the string is this, and then it will give you the data for the string. Okay, so that's great. Java is great. If you go in C, C is like, we don't want all this extra meta information. It adds to the memory footprint of the program and stuff like that. So we're just going to say there's a string and it starts here. Here's a pointer to the start of it. Just read it until you hit a null character. And when you hit the null character, you know you've reached the end. Okay? You don't even know it's a string. It's just bytes. You read in the bytes and then your code will start using it as if it's a string. Okay? That's how C works. So if this library is written in C, it might terminate at the Google or at the null character. So if it terminates at the, at the null character, then what domain is being asked about? Google.com, okay? So some CAs may look at the string and say it's, it's a Concordia request, and some of them may look at it and say it's a Google request, okay? That's not dangerous in and of itself. I mean, if I'm Concordia, uh, I actually own Concordia, so if the CA interprets it as Concordia, it will give me a certificate for Concordia that I'm entitled to all of that. If I'm Concordia and it, the CA thinks I'm asking about Google, it will send the challenge to Google. I won't be able to answer it because I'm Concordia, so I won't get the certificate. Okay? So there's actually no danger yet. Okay? It's just, it's kind of frustrating that parsing is always hard and different CAs will behave differently. Okay? 
But what happens if the CA interprets it one way and my browser, when I ultimately get the certificate, it interprets it a different way, okay? So for example, let's say that I go to it and the CA says I'm gonna drop the special character. It will give me, it will sign my request. This is also an important semantic difference. So when it gives me the certificate, it doesn't copy what it thinks the domain is into a new certificate and sign it. What I do is I actually just give it the unsigned certificate, which includes the null character, and I ask it to sign it. So it will go through all its checks, and if it comes out the other end, it will apply a signature to the unsigned thing that I gave it. In other words, it's going to sign it with the null character intact, okay? So the CA drops the null character, um, then it thinks it's for concordia.ca, I pass all the checks, so now I have a certificate for google.com null.concordia.ca, okay? Then I start putting it on the wire when people are going to google.com and their browsers are written in C. So they, they, they look and they say, okay, I got this certificate. I got to make sure that it matches the website I'm visiting. I'm trying to go to google.com. I go to this certificate and it's for google.com null. Oh yeah, okay, I'll just stop there. And yeah, I'm, I'm, this certificate's for google.com and I'm going to google.com. Okay, so the danger with parsing is when two different people look at the same thing and they come to different conclusions about what it means, okay? That's where you can exploit uh, things. Um, so yeah, so the, the options are, if you look at a string, you could just reject it, you could drop the null character, or you could terminate at the null character. And if everyone does the same thing, it doesn't matter. You can do one, two, or three, the world is safe, okay? But when some people do two and some people do three, that's where you start to get into problems, okay? So for example, if the CA does this, then it will issue the certificate thinking it's for concordia.ca. And if the browser does this, then it will think it's actually a certificate for google.com even though it was issued to someone at concordia.ca, okay? So it's effectively a Google certificate, all right? So anyway, so they, they found a bunch of parsing mismatches. This is like kind of the simplest. There's, there's a lot that get like kind of complicated uh, that you can look at the uh, papers if you're interested in more. Okay, another thing is revocation. So we mentioned this idea that what if someone steals your private key, okay? Then do you have any way to recover from that at all, okay? Okay, so here's what happens. Um, Let's say that, that I have a certificate. I have, there's a private key that corresponds to my public key that's in the certificate. Someone else steals it. Now there's two people in the world that know my private key. There's me and there's also the adversary, okay? What the adversary can do is anytime they see someone connecting to my website is they can, they can just give them the same certificate that I'm giving them because they know the private key and then they can negotiate all the crypto and they can have the tunnel end at them. Yeah. Uh, so it's a good question. So session hijacking usually refers to it was the tunnel was set up and now you want to attack it after it's set up, right? So that's sort of like the hijacking. It's like it's already there and you're going to hijack it. You can't do that. So if the person's, <coughs> if the user is able to get through the whole SSL handshake with, with the right entity and the tunnel gets established, and the adversary comes along after, they're not able to break into the tunnel. But if the adversary is there when the tunnel's being set up, then what they can do is they can set it up like this, where they, um, where they, uh, they basically separate the tunnel. So they, you have a tunnel from you to the adversary and then from the adversary to the user. So for example, let's say DBS is broadcasting. Another yeah. tunnel person, anonymous, just shows their background. What, what will really happen? Okay, sorry, can you repeat it? So. Yeah. Okay, so the um, uh, you mean like a video feed or something like that, right? Yeah. Oh, so it could happen in different ways. Uh, probably the most logical explanation is they actually hack the server that's serving up the video. So they're not attacking the connections. The problem is if you have a thousand people watching it, there's a thousand connections 
right, going in. So they're probably not in the middle of all 1,000. They, they could try and drop the video in the connections, but then they're doing it, like, for everyone that's watching it, they're doing it individually, right? If they can attack the distribution point of the video, then the video plays to all 1,000 people watching, you know, and it plays the wrong video or whatever. So in those types of scenarios, they're probably not attacking it on the channel. They're attacking it at the server itself. Okay, all right, so what happens is uh, you, uh, let's say your, your key gets stolen by anonymous or whoever, all right? Then you say, okay, you go to your CA and say, my key was stolen, give me a new one. Or I have a new one, give me a new certificate. And that's fine, they'll give you a new certificate, okay? But now there's two certificates floating around. There's the new certificate that only you know the key of, and there's the old one uh, that the adversary knows. And the adversary can continue using your old one. Okay, so they can break any tunnel uh, when it's being set up uh, by dropping the old certificate in. Okay, so yeah, yeah. So could you remove the old one and get a new one? So that's the that's the question, right? <coughs> so is there a way to revoke or cancel the old one or not? Okay, so let's think about it. Like, how how would you do that? Okay, so you would have to register the fact that it's revoked somewhere. Okay. But then the user also needs to, to learn of it somehow. So they have to check it or something like that. Okay. All right. So yeah, so, so to your point, uh, so getting a new certificate doesn't solve the problem. We need to cancel or revoke the old one. Okay, so there's two ways to do this. So the first option is we do what's called the status check. Uh, and Basically, what we do is every time we get a certificate, we have to ask whether this has been revoked or not. Okay. Now, the question is, well, who do we ask? Okay. Okay. So what we do is we look in the certificate itself. The certificate will say um, the CA created that certificate or they signed off on it. And so they'll put that information into the certificate itself. Okay. So the CA that issued it, so if I go to concordia.ca, and it's issued by Global Sign. Global Sign has a server they put up, and every user, everyone in this room, every time you go to Concordia.ca, maybe not every time, you might cache the response for a bit, but, but most of the times you go, uh, in addition to going to Concordia.ca, you're also going to send a message to Global Sign, and you're just going to say, I just got this certificate, is it still valid? And then Global Sign will say, yeah or no, okay? So the, the server you can see, um, so th the whole protocol is called OCSP, uh, Online Certificate Status Protocol. Most servers are at OCSP dot and then the name of the CA, but it doesn't necessarily have to be there. And it's in the certificate itself. So the certificate tells you where to go in order to hit this, okay? So in this case, this is where it would go for Concordia's case. Okay, so the first issue with this is, let's say you're, you're a really good CA. Uh, everyone loves you. Google is using you as a CA. Facebook's using you. And then Twitter, now X, they, you know, they see that Facebook and Google are using you. You must be good. So they start using you as well. Okay, now imagine every user that goes to one of these three websites. Okay, these are huge companies. They have lots of infrastructure. They have CDNs all that type of stuff because they get a ton of traffic, okay? Every user that goes to this website, guess what? They're also coming to your website because they have to check whether the certificate's valid or not, okay? You're just a CA. You're not, you're not Google, right? You're just a CA. You, you charged Google $2,000 for the certificate and now you have, you know, I don't know, 100 million people every second hitting your server and you have to handle all that traffic. What's going to happen? your server is going to go down, okay? And so CAs were just not set up in order to do this, and it would cost so much to actually run this protocol for a big website uh, like Google that, that, that they would just never keep up, okay? All right, so then the question is, if it's going to fail, right, what happens? So you, you go and you try and ask Google CA about this certificate, and you don't get a response, what are you going to do? You're the browser, you're the user, you're the browser deciding what to do in this case. So what you could do is you could just say, we didn't get a response and throw an error 
and ask the user, you know, do you want to go to the website anyway? It might be a revoke certificate. You could throw them a warning. Okay. The problem is if you did that uh, as a browser, then almost every website you would go to, you would see that warning because no website has a CA that can keep up to all these status checks. Okay. So what browser said is like, it's just not realistic. So what we're going to do is we're going to fail open as it's called. Uh, so if we're going to try, we're going to send the message and ask, is this revoked or not? And if we do not hear a response, we're going to assume it's okay. Okay. If we hear a yes, it's good. We'll assume it's okay. If we hear a no, it's not good. Then we'll, we'll, we'll not allow it. And if we hear nothing at all, we're going to assume it's the first case. Okay. So we call this failing open. It's a big problem in security. Obviously you wouldn't want to do it, but if you do the opposite and fail closed, uh, then you're going to break a whole bunch of websites and, and then your users are going to be mad at you and they're going to not use your browser. They're going to use the other browser or something like that. Okay. Is this secure? So you have a revoke certificate. You're already in the middle. You're using your revoke certificate. You drop it in. The next thing the user says is you see them go over to the CA asking, is this valid or not? What are you going to do? You're already in the middle. So you see them asking, hey, CA, is this certificate I just got valid? Then you're just going to drop it, right? It's that simple. Uh, and then they won't hear back from the CA. Or you can wait and see if the CA sends a no, you could drop the no. So it doesn't matter. You can drop the request or the response. And then the, they're going to assume it's okay and then they'll continue using it, okay? So there's actually no way using this protocol to practically revoke the certificate if the adversary is in the middle because the adversary can always drop the response, okay? Now, the other thing you might notice is that URL, is that encrypted or not? No. It's not encrypted, right? It's going over HTTP, okay? Um, and so why? Well, first off, why? What's the problem with that? Hi, is this certificate revoked? Yes, it's revoked. It's not over HTTP. The adversary changes the yes to a no. Okay. All right. So that seems stupid. Why not make this over HTTPS? Okay. That's exactly the response. So then you go to https.ocsb.globalsign.com. Then your browser's like, give me the certificate for globalsign.com and you get it. And then it has to ask, is this revoked or not? And then it's going to go to HTTPS dot something else. Then it's going to get a certificate for that website. And then it's going to have to ask, is this revoked or not? And you end up in this continuous loop and you can't break out of it. Okay. So you cannot run this protocol over HTTPS. Okay. Anyways, uh, we're, we're running out of time. Uh, so why don't we just pause here and we'll pick it up next class. Thanks.